we're gonna get uh, we're gonna get back to the present day, back to the natural world, and uh, back to our fantastic special guest tonight, Mr. Doctor, Mr. Doctor, Doctor, Mister <laughs> Brody. I mean Doug. Mr. Doctor, Doc. Let me just start. Hold on a second. Everyone, will you please welcome and give a large hand of applause to Dr. <laughs> Douglas Long. Damn you and your technology, my friend. <laughs> okay. All righty. Thank you. Um, love you. We love you. Yeah. Oh. Oh. You're going to be hearing a lot from that drunken man in the back <laughs> all night long. I've had a migraine all day, so I forgot what I was going to talk about. So I'm just going to make stuff up for the next couple hours. What I want to warn you people is that uh, all the good stuff is in the second show. So don't think that it's a school night. You're going to sneak out of here early. <laughs> this is from the um, harmful effects of the sun. So make sure you wear your sunscreen. Alrighty, um, I wanted to try to dispel a little misnomer with uh, the flyers uh, that advertise the exotic travels. And that's sort of an old Victorian approach where you go to sort of underdeveloped nations and sort of point at the weird things they do, like kiss Buddha's feet and play with snakes and things like that. Today, exotic travels mean that you're a yuppie and you can buy your way up uh, uh, the Himalayas, or if you're some sort of dot-com deadhead, you can go to, you know, Thailand for a couple weeks and you're all of a sudden enlightened. What I'm going to talk about is basically what I do for a living. It's my job, and I get to travel all around the world and, and play with animals, and I couldn't think of anything more fun than that, so. Uh, we talked about what is exotic, and what we think is exotic is sort of a cultural bias, that these are people basically living their own culture, and it's so different from ours that we think it's strange. Or what we tend to do is, is label something is as exotic when actually it's something that's become extremely tired and commercial. <laughs> so whereas a culture is living out its own identity and its own history, um, we try to sort of emulate different cultures, try to take those exotic elements to try to make it something different than sort of our own mundane lives. But um, most people, when they're kids, usually don't, they never realize their dream of growing up to be what they want to be. And I'm proud to say that actually, what I always wanted to do as a kid is travel the world and study animals. Like when you watch Wild Kingdom, they're in Africa, and they're like, you know, tagging water buffalo. Or they're wrestling snakes in the Amazon or something like that. And I always wanted to do that. Fortunately, I had parents that were able to sort of help me with that. So on my birthday, I'd usually pick some zoo that I wanted to go to or an alligator farm or a, a museum somewhere. And it's something that I had as both a, uh, a vocation and an avocation as I was growing up. <laughs> During high school, I had the privilege of working in the largest fish taxidermy shop in all of North America. <laughs> Believe it or not, when millionaires want to get that Marlin stuff to put on the wall, 90% of all the Marlins stuffed in the U.S. went through our shop. So during high school, I actually got a chance to study the diversity of life and also study, you know, basic anatomy. So it's a type of schooling that most people never really got to have. How much does that cost? How much does it cost to mount one of those? Back in uh, early 1980s dollars, it cost anywhere from two to 600 for your average Marlin, depending on the, the style of the mount and the size of the fish. Although most of those fish people look at these things and say it looks all plasticky, and that's because most of it is plastic and body filler, and there's just a few little bits of fish in there. Uh, during my undergraduate years, I had uh, uh, the privilege of going to school out at UC Riverside, which was surrounded by mountains. It was near the coast and near the deserts, and I did a lot of work on uh, rattlesnakes. This is outside of Palm Springs, where Sonny Bono used to live. Um, and this, is the desert this is also, you can notice before I discovered how many calories are in beer. <laughs> Increase in my girth. But unfortunately, and then uh, when I finally went to graduate school, I really got to do fun stuff, and I spent about five years 
um, working, uh, studying great white sharks and working with uh, pinnipeds. This is an uh, elephant seal that had a single bite taken out of it. So oh, pretty oh, fun. Oh, and these sharks are swimming right off San Francisco today. Did you rule it suicide? No, it was not suicide. <laughs> and then I also... I also worked uh, as a field agent for the federal government since marine mammals are protected by law even when they're dead. When dead whales and dolphins and seals wash up, we have to investigate and find out just who killed them. So just like Quincy would have like some, you know, punk rocker that died in a club and wanted to find out that it was murder. Well, that's what we do. There we go. So I still do that. Um, I also was a um, uh, college professor at St. Mary's College. Anybody ever heard of that place in the East Bay? Yeah, it's, it's where um, uh, Diane Whipple was the lacrosse coach who was savagely attacked and killed by the dogs. And, and St. Mary's College is going to come back several times in this talk because the world is united in some really freaky ways. Uh, but now I work over at the California Academy of Sciences, and that's the Science Museum in Golden Gate Park that has the planetarium and the aquarium. What most people don't get to see is that we have seven research um, facilities, seven different research departments where they study all the different plants and animals and rocks on the earth. Now what most of you are familiar with are the public displays, but um, what the Academy is really known for is its scientific angle. And we are the oldest natural history museum west of Mississippi. We were established in 1853, destroyed in the 1906 fire and earthquake, and reborn from the ashes thereof. Now, the different research departments house scientific collections of birds, snakes, plants, animals, and they have researchers that study those animals. And I work for the Department of Ornithology and Mammalogy, which means birds and mammals. And I'm in charge of some 100,000 plus bird specimens and about 30,000 mammal specimens. And I wanted to briefly go through why scientific collections are important and then use that as a springboard to talk about why I'm going all over the world doing sort of the name things that you're going to see uh, graphically illustrated in full color. <laughs> a scientific collection is not like a collection you would have, say, of Beanie Babies or of baseball cards. It's not sort of a, a... It isn't. We don't have any Beanie Babies, but we do have some fantastic animals. It's more like a scientific library because we have animals that have scientific information and that information is made available to researchers all over the world and people involved in many different aspects of science and more importantly conservation of these animals that we have uh, probably one of the premier roles in protecting endangered species in giving evidence to federal governments to set aside reserves and preserves and to have concrete scientific information that is used to study and better understand animals and ecosystems. So let me, let me go back. Uh, these cases here house some of the 100,000 plus bird specimens. I think we have about 400,000 reptiles. We have 2.5 million fish, over 7 million insects, um, about 2 million invertebrates, um, all kinds of rocks, archaeological material. Fantastic place. They're housed in these wonderful uh, steel cases. And you open up the cases and pull out the drawers and you see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dead birds, for example. And people, people get really upset about this. They look at these things and say, oh my god, how can you protect a species when you're going out and killing them? Well, let me put things into a little bit of perspective. All of the birds in all of the scientific museums in all of North America are about 4.5 to about 5.5 million specimens. The number of birds killed by house cats in a single year is six million. <laughs> the number of birds killed by automobiles is anywhere between 80 and 160 million a year. The number of birds killed by high-rise office towers with those beautiful reflective glass panels that make it look like you're flying into a cloud, those kill an estimated five to 20 million birds a year. And the numbers get staggering. It's been estimated that half a billion birds are killed every single year uh, by a variety of human causes. So five million birds representing all the specimens collected from the 1700s till now throughout the entire world that are housed in North American collections are just an absolute fraction. But these specimens provide the bulk of the scientific information that's used for field guides, that's used for drafting laws, that's used for uh, setting up uh, wildlife 
uh, protected habitats. Because each one, of these, each one of these little birds, as I said, is sort of like a library. It's like a little book that it has certain bits of information about the time and place associated with that animal. Um, its weight, stomach contents, um, reproductive capacity, uh, location, data was collected. So all that information can be used to better understand a species. And so people always say, well, don't you have enough of these things? But what's important is to try to keep that sort of linear approach, both chronologically and geographically, so that we're constantly exploring new areas and collecting new specimens. And again, these specimens are absolutely vital for everything from basic bird watchers to people up at uh, Capitol Hill. What's that? These are spotted skunks. This is basically um, the same way we preserve those little birds. We have the uh, spotted skunks here. This was probably one of the most common mammals in California up until about the 1980s when they picked up uh, feline distemper from house cats. And they've been wiped out through the entire state. They're really cool little skunks. Uh, we also house a variety of other collections. Um, osteological material that's used by archaeologists, for example, when they want to identify bones from archaeological deposits because it's very important to understand the culture of, say, Native Americans, their religious beliefs based on bone remains that are found in burial sites or bones that are found in old, uh, what are called kitchen mittens, old basically food trash heaps. They can tell you a lot about their technology and a lot about their migration. Uh, this is our pelt room. We use this quite frequently when we work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. When somebody is trying to bring material in from outside, and we actually use these to identify what are endangered species that are being smuggled into the U.S. And here, this is a variety of uh, uh, tanagers and small uh, birds from Ecuador collected in the 1960s. But you can see each one of these has a tag with that scientific information. That information is also entered into a computer, and oftentimes those databases are put into mapping programs. So we had, for example, the, um, the Department of Reclamation that's having a big um, project on the Colorado River. Before they do any damming on the Colorado River, they need to know what animals are living there because they need to know what species are being impacted. So we just basically typed in those counties in Arizona, Nevada, and California that are on the border on the Colorado River and we're able to download over 2,000 records for the government so they know what species were there, what habitats live there, and more importantly, they can have a much more comprehensive plan on how to protect the organisms living in that area. So it's not like a stale, stuffy collection of just sort of dead things that we constantly pile in. It's a very <laughs> vibrant and very living collection of scientific information that's constantly being farmed out to different scientists and different agencies all around, literally all around the world. We've worked with the Mexican government for years, basically telling them what used to live in some of these different areas that were, say, turned to agricultural areas 100 years ago. We have collections going back, in some cases, to the 1820s. Uh, this is part of a collection here that came back from, uh, is this Burma Joe? Looks like it. Um, these are uh, a variety of reptiles that's part of a, uh, a project I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit later. Um, different ways we preserve animals, uh, this way probably being the easiest in which they're uh, fixed in formal, meaning the tissues are sort of made permanent so they won't rot and then they're stored in ethanol. Um, and I'm going to talk about sort of some of the nice places I've been to. In the last year, I've been to seven different countries on three different continents. And I had a lot of friends hounding me to give them slideshows since I took, I think, somewhere between four and 6,000 slides in the last year, and I forgot. I'm not a photographer. My photographer is this belligerent uh, six-foot uh, two Chinese guy here. Um, he says I take crappy pictures because I have a bad camera, and it's true. So I got uh, a few of those. I want to talk about some of the... Um, I guess a couple of the brighter sides, um, Chile and New Zealand, and then after the break we're going to talk about uh, uh, what's going on in Asia right now and then also what's going on in Western Africa. Um, I went um, to Chile uh, a year ago last spring, and Chile has a coastline that's almost 3,000 miles long and literally has tens of thousands of islands along its coastline. And Chile has not been very well explored biologically because there are so many islands. And so there are some islands where people have no idea what's there. And one of the basic things that the California Academy of Sciences does, as well as other scientific institutions, is mount what we call biodiversity surveys. Going into an area and seeing just what the heck is there. Because you can't protect a species unless you know where that species lives. You can't protect a habitat unless you know what species make up that habitat and how that ecosystem is all woven together by the different plants and animals that live there. 
So the most basic understanding, just what the heck is there, what habitats they live in, you have to understand that first before you can do anything else in terms of protecting the environment or saving the planet. We always hear about saving the planet. Well, you got to know what the heck is living in this darn planet before you do anything about saving it. Um, so fortunately, I got to um, go to uh, fly into beautiful Santiago, Chile, which is very similar to Los Angeles in its geographic placement and therefore has uh, a lot of problems with smog. So this is your sort of typical morning in Santiago, Chile. And this is downtown Santiago. It's got a little more of that uh, architecture, that sort of, uh, sort of kind of old, new world, colonial, kind of post-neo-industrial kind of thing going on. <laughs> oh, and a, and a theme that's going to be woven through this whole evening is the, the pleasures and the benefits of alcohol. And something I want to point out right now are these two trees that are called Chilean wine palms. They're, they're almost extinct in most of Chile because what you can do is hack these things down and that little, not little, but this gigantic trunk has a very sugary pulp and it'll naturally ferment and sort of a wine-like liqueur will just start oozing out the back. In some cases, will ooze for up to two years. And so this produced apparently a very potent and very tasty alcohol that uh, the early conquistadors all the way up through the uh, uh, later centuries enjoyed and as a result this tree is uh, extremely rare. There are some of these growing in Golden Gate Park by the way. So <laughs> keep that in mind. I actually planted, I was going to plant some of these in my backyard but I heard that this takes about 150 years to sort of reach that height. But this is uh, um, very near where um, uh, Augusto Pinochet uh, with the help of the CIA overthrew uh, the uh, Chilean sort of slightly left-leaning government of Salvador Allende who, who while he was pent up in his palace and was being bomb bombarded by uh, what are they, F4s? Wellman? No, sound effects. Sound effects? They're bombarded by sound effects of F4s. He um, committed suicide, quote unquote, and actually he was assassinated by uh, Pinochet's troops that were backed by the CIA. Uh, that's neither here nor there. What they got now is uh, McDonald's. We're going to take a slight diversion. Um, Santiago. No, it gets better. It gets better. It gets, just, just hold on. Um, Santiago, incredibly, parts of it look just like Southern California. That's because a lot of the same contractors that built parts of Orange County and San Diego County came in and actually built um, many parts of it. This is on John F. Kennedy Drive. <laughs> Kennedy actually opened up some of the first major um, uh, trading networks with Chile. Uh, but what I wanted to show you is this reminded me of the old Pulp Fiction thing about what do they call a, a quarter pounder. Well, apparently, even though they have the metric system, they call a quarter pounder the cuarto de libre con queso. That's a quarter pounder They also got the McNuggets de pollo there. <laughs> On this street I was on, in a four block area, there were three McDonald's, a Home Depot, a Wendy's, and a few other disgusting tidbits of Americana. When we get to other things, like when we talk about Burma a little bit later, you're not going to see really any hint of America there, which I think is a very good thing. But anyway, this has nothing to do with science. Oh yeah, okay, so they got McDonald's? They got Telesandwich right here. I, I took this out of a, a, a car window. I'm sorry, it's a little bit cloudy. But I thought, this is the best thing in the world. And I asked people about what Telesandwich was, and they said, you phone them, you tell them what you want on your sandwich, and a half hour later, they deliver it. Yeah. Uh, is there anything like that in the States? If I said, I want, you know, deviled eggs with two slices of avocado, you hang up the phone. 20 minutes, half hour later, tell a sandwich, boom, they're there. I don't know, it's a Chilean original. It just hasn't caught on like McDonald's has. Okay, now Chile, because it is so huge, and I'm going to talk about the similarities between Chile and, and New Zealand in just a second. It's a very large area, and the relative population is small. That's because the amount of land is so huge compared to the amount of people living there. And Chile is actually one of the largest exporters of agricultural crops uh, in South America. They export, most of our winter fruit comes from there. Uh, huge amounts of wine, Chilean wine is great. But because of the yuppie.com boom, you see this happening right here. These are chips from old growth uh, forests in Chile that are used strictly for the thermal paper and fax machines. That's all it's used for. And this is all shipped to the US. Um, you can see this is, this is a guard post right here, so a person would be standing sort of about yay big right there. And uh, the person I was with estimated there were probably about 100,000 trees here. 
And this is shipped out three times a week. What's the, what's the wood? The wood is some kind of, uh, some kind of southern hemisphere podocarp thing. Yeah, yeah. You know what a podocarp is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She's a, I'm, I'm not a botanist, I'm a scientist, but she knows the whole body. <laughs> but for the most part, Chile is a relatively developed nation, but there are still many parts of the economy that's based on subsistence agriculture. So we see a lot of slash and burn right here, where basically they cut down the forest and burn it off and clear croplands for, for cattle grazing. Which, it's not as bad as, say, like in Brazil or in parts of northern Argentina, where just huge amounts are burned off every single day. But in Chile, it's starting to get a little bad. Now, those little islands I talked about, there are hundreds of thousands of islands, and this is basically sort of one of them. Uh, and so what we would do is just sort of land a boat on here and just go out and look to see what birds were there and document what species were there, what time of day they were there, and what sort of plants they were living in. And it's just sort of basic stuff, but again, you know, this is your clean slate. Nobody has any idea what's there. I mean, we have a general idea because we know what sort of birds live there, but not really that much information. There are so many blanks all around the world that need to be filled in. People think that, you know, all the world's been explored. Well, all the world is populated, but most of the world hasn't really been coherently explored in terms of trying to understand just what the heck is living there. And in many cases, humans have got there and have destroyed a lot of the habitats before scientists have got in to be able to just answer those most basic questions. The guy on the right here, um, who I traveled with in, uh, in Chile, is probably the person who was responsible for saving the uh, California condor. This is a guy named Frank Todd. He's one of the crankiest guys I know. He's like one of these people that's, uh, that's like a highly functional alcoholic. Which I think is like, if you can like just drink yourself into a stupor every day and still get incredible amounts of stuff done. Yeah. You are just so thumbs up with me. But uh, he was uh, chief of av aviculture. Aviculture is bird breeding for the uh, Los Angeles Zoo for about 12 years and chief of aviculture for SeaWorld for I think about another 15. Anybody ever been to the penguin encounter down in SeaWorld? Yeah. This guy raised over 4,000 different species of birds in his life and he, he basically wrote the book on penguin breeding biology. He also came up with the techniques to be able to raise the California condor which would have gone extinct without his expertise because the remaining California condors in the wild were taken into captivity and put through a captive breeding program. And when the last condors were taken out of the wild, a lot of these sort of environmentalists, quote unquote, were just absolutely up in arms. Well, the population had been declining stepwise just about every year, and I think they were down to like six left in the wild. And managed to, in zoos, breed the population up to I think about 160 now, and they've been released in three different states. So, I tip my hat to that man. Uh, Chile, you can see here, there are many areas that have been completely untouched. It is still an absolutely fantastic place. Um, th these are um, the southern Andes, and this looks a lot like you'd see in the Rockies. But you don't get bears down there, and fortunately you don't even get mosquitoes down there. It's an absolutely yeah. wonderful place. Now there are some areas where glaciers come down to the coast. These are called littoral glaciers, and when we're tooting around in boats, we'd sometimes come across these. You can see sort of the general size of a glacier. The glacier basically starts on a mountaintop where snow has been piling on and piling on and through gravity and pressure that ice pack is being pushed down and pushed down and pushed down. So the ice at what's called the toe of the glacier is the oldest ice. And so when we got here I asked one of our Chilean researchers just how old this ice was and he estimated based on the growth of the glacier that the ice was probably about 12,000 years old. So I thought, cocktails. <laughs> So I made sure to get some ice and take, yeah. it, take it back. And we made cocktails with ice that was what, four times older than the pyramids in Egypt, six times older than Jesus himself. So I thought, that's great stuff. We had cocktails that night. Now, one of the places we spent a considerable amount of time was this area here. This is the largest national park. Maybe it's not the largest, but it's the most well-known national park in all of Chile. Now, Chile is fortunate in that they have reserved more of their land for national parks and protected areas than any country in the world. I think they have 22% of, of their country's land set aside as national parks and preserved areas, which is pretty fantastic because I think in the U.S. it's something like 8% or some piddly little number. We have like places like Yellowstone that seem huge. And when you look on the map, I mean, Ted Turner's ranch is actually bigger than Yellowstone. It's pretty embarrassing. 
But this is uh, Torres del Paine National Park, um, which is in the uh, southern, uh, southern end of the Andes. And it's an absolutely beautiful area. And we went there to look for um, these Andean condors. Uh, Frank Todd did a lot of his original work with condor breeding using the Andean condors uh, to try to understand how we can breed California condors. And these are pretty damn big birds. We saw 54 that day. Uh, which is a huge amount because in many areas of South America they've been hunted out. Um, What's the wingspan? Wingspan, um, I think six to nine feet depending on the, the maturity of the animal. Pretty big. Uh, when we were actually going into the park I saw this sign and I wasn't sure what it meant. I thought campo because campo means like in Spanish like like camp or countryside kind of thing. And you know campo <laughs> mino peligro mine, mine camp. Like okay you know, maybe the guy's name is mine and this is my camp. Or something like that. I wasn't really sure until a, a, a quarter mile later we saw this one here where it says in, in English, it clears the bell, danger mines. Well, this is because way back in, was it the 70s when we had a little spit or a little bits of island called the Falkland Islands that uh, Britain had possession over that the Argentines invaded one weekend. And the British and the U.S. worked out a secret deal with Chile. And the Chileans thought that, excuse me, the uh, Argentines thought that the British were going to attack from the Atlantic. So they had all of their ships on the eastern side of the Falklands just waiting for this British invasion. Well, they had worked out a special deal with the uh, Chileans to actually come through Chile and come from the west. And this area here is the narrowest part. If you saw that on that map, Chile is this long little strip of the west coast of South America. And at the narrowest point, I think it's like 3.5 miles wide. And so British jets actually snuck through here, went sort of over the peaks of the National Park and down in. Now, after the British had this decisive naval defeat of the Argentine Navy, the Chileans all of a sudden got really nervous that the um, Argentines were going to turn their aggression against them, so they mined most of their border. And in this case, the border comes right through the park. Uh, so we had to be a little careful. And I asked why these hadn't been cleared away, and they said, well, they just hadn't got around to it. So, you know, every once in a while, um, Guanacos, which you'll see, sort of get blown up there. Um, there's, yeah, I know, it's cute. Uh, because it's a protected area, a lot of the animals aren't really scared of people like they should be, so you're able to sort of get close and get some very Did nice you stake that one out on a board, Brody? No, I didn't. I didn't have a, a collecting permit. We were just doing a visual survey. Uh, these are Guanacos, which are a relative of the llama. This is the, uh, this is the money shot right here. Yeah. All righty. And, um... We ended up actually seeing uh, about 175 different species of birds, and we went to several dozen different islands. We finally made our way down to the tip of Terra del Fuego. We actually followed the same path that Charles Darwin took when he uh, was in the Beagle uh, as, a, as a young man, uh, scouring the world for scientific information and putting together his ideas about uh, biological evolution. Finally make it down here to... Um, uh, Ushuaia, which is down at the very southern tip in Argentina. And I took a picture of this because these are the southernmost dumpsters in the western hemisphere. <laughs> About five feet after this, it's water, and then it's clear sailing all the way to Antarctica. <laughs> oh, and then, yeah, and then on the way back, I stopped by. I saw my good friend. I didn't cry for her. <laughs> all right. Okay. So. Chile was a fantastic place and still has a lot to offer. In fact, I've uh, worked with a, a Chilean uh, ornithologist who's here in the U.S., and we're actually trying to work out some deals with the Chilean government to um, work on a cooperative venture to go and explore a lot more of these islands. And also we want to explore the northern border with Peru because it's a, it's a desert area that no one's really spent any time in. And Peru has a completely different bird fauna than is found normally in Chile. And we're very interested in the, how many of those critters are spilling over. Um, so Chile is a relatively well-off country in terms of preserving habitat and still maintaining much of the wildlife that it had originally. Now, New Zealand is a little bit different and still a little bit the same. Uh, I spent a month in New Zealand on both the North and the South Island going to different uh, bird conservation programs. i explain why. How I was able to do this was actually through a long process, and again, this is where booze comes in. A good friend of mine owns this winery in, um, in New Zealand, which is the preferred wine of New Zealand Parliament. It's not the official wine because it's owned by Americans, and they couldn't get it passed as being the official winery because it's not owned by New Zealanders. 
But it is, it is their favorite wine. It's called Kimblefield. It's actually absolutely fantastic stuff. This is the winery there. And I was very interested in these birds. These are in, back in my aviaries at home. This is a this bird called the uh, Australian magpie, which is very different than our magpies here in North America. But it's a species of bird that was introduced, meaning it was brought from Australia and released into New Zealand in the 1860s. And the government wants to eradicate these birds. And they used to have these poisoning projects that actually give farmers, you know, free sacks of bird poison and give you instructions on how to do it. Because they maintained that these birds ate the nestlings and the eggs of native birds, which sounds fine. I mean, I'm all for that, preserving the native species and getting rid of the non-native things that are destroying the country. It turns out that actually some of the developing agriculture, such as wineries and soybeans, are sort of preferred foods of these birds. And under New Zealand law, they can't eradicate these uh, unless they are posing a threat to uh, the native wildlife. So there's been a sort of hokey story made up. Fortunately, and this is where sort of animal rights groups actually have, have made a difference, is that um, they came up with a program to, instead of killing these birds, to try to ship them to other countries sell them, recoup the money, and use that money for conservation programs. So I was actually the recipient of some of the first, actually it was the first shipment of these birds into North America, and at the time only two zoos in the entire U.S. had any. And so in my backyard I had as many as the San Antonio Zoo and the L.A. Zoo combined. Uh, but they're fantastic birds. They're smart, they're intelligent, they have this, this loud warbling sound that sounds like a, a broken down calliope organ. So anyway, the winery actually had a very large population of these birds, and they would have different tactics to try to scare them away from the grapes. They didn't want to poison them, so one of the things they had was a go-kart with this huge loudspeaker. And they'd pay little local kids to drive up and down the road with this like loud screaming music during, during the harvest to scare these birds away. They also discovered that it's actually cheaper to put up a very thin mesh of net over the... Um, the rows of grapes, so that's what they're doing this year, is putting this mesh over just so the birds can't get in. And they're actually, in the first year, um, they're more than making up for the cost of the mesh. Anyway. So when people think of, people think of New Zealand, they think of sheep, and they're, and they're right. Um, the total population of New Zealand is only about uh, three and a half million people, which is about the same population in the nine barrier counties. But that is spread over an area the size of California, Washington, and Oregon combined. Uh, but there are something like, I, was, I heard something like 700 million sheep, it's just this huge, huge number. And most of the sheep is shipped overseas. Now, because of synthetics, the wool industry has, has absolutely collapsed. But fortunately, because of hoof and mouth disease and uh, mad cow disease, uh, New Zealand is set to actually prosper quite well because um, they're not allowed to import any agricultural products in, and so their sheep have basically been isolated for about the last hundred years. So they're completely free of hoof and mouth, and completely free of bad cow disease. And that's not too bad, because if you're a meat eater, if you're a meat eater, you can still just pig out. And it's nothing like, like, like lamb curry. But anyway, New Zealand is also an, an a continent of many diverse habitats and a lot of just absolutely incredible beauty. I was there for a month and I, if I could go back to any country in the world, I'd go back there. If I ever get kicked out of the U.S., that is my first destination. A beautiful, beautiful place. Um, but it's not without its problems. Um, in fact, New Zealand, New Zealand, just kicking it with my, uh, my Maori, uh, um, homies. Um, New Zealand is not without a lot of incredible environmental problems, and they're actually coming up with some very novel ways of solving them. And more importantly, New Zealand is very similar in California in many ways, in terms of uh, similarities in agriculture, in terms of similarities in economy, and more importantly, in terms of similarities in their ecologies and their ecosystems. So a lot of what New Zealand is doing, we can apply to what some of our potential problems are in the future in California and how to solve them. Well, going back about, I think it's about 700 years ago, the first inhabitants came to New Zealand, and these are the uh, precursors of the Maoris, which are the native inhabitants, the native uh, people that came originally, I believe, from the Cook Islands. And when they got there, they saw these big giant birds that are called moas. There are about 13 species of moas. Some of them were probably in excess of 10 feet tall. These were um, distant relatives of the ostriches, and they were huge animals. And because New Zealand evolved in isolation for about 80 million years, completely inaccessible from other continents, 
it developed a very unique fauna of primarily birds. Birds evolved before mammals did for the most part. And so we tend to find uh, weird and rare diversity of birds in New Zealand. So these uh, elephant birds were actually apparently very easy targets. They were totally flightless and provided a lot of food. And the archaeological evidence uh, shows that they were hunted in extraordinary numbers. Uh, there were some recent studies done earlier this year showing that the moas were wiped out within just a few hundred years um, after the introduction of, of people. Now after Westerners or Europeans got to the island, there was sort of a second major catastrophe, and that was alteration of the habitat, introduction of non-native species. These are species of animals brought from uh, Europe and North America that were not part of the native ecosystem, so these animals had no way of dealing with them. And through just sort of general hunting and habitat destruction, this is an extinct bird called the huia. And the huia has these black feathers with white tips. And the Maori chieftains used to wear these in their hair to signal their stature or their status in the iwi or, or in their tribe. And this was sort of picked up as sort of a cool thing to do if you were a Western New Zealander. You would wear a hat with a couple um, huia feathers in it. And so it became sort of an industry to go out and shoot huias and make hats and sell them to the Europeans. And so these birds were basically driven into, into extinction because of a fashion trend. Now there are many other very interesting birds in New Zealand. There are several other species that have gone extinct, but there are some that are just barely holding on. This is a little bird called a kokako. And the kokako basically has taken the role of a squirrel. Now there are no squirrels in New Zealand. And so this bird actually has these uh, long legs. You can't really see it because they're sort of tucked behind them. But they actually run with their legs. They don't fly, but they run and scurry between branches. Uh, this bird here has actually declined severely. This is something called a kaka. A lot of these are Maori names. And the kaka, we think it's a type of parrot. And we think about parrots as jungle living birds. They live in the tropics. This is actually a species that lives up in the snow, high up in mountains. This is a mountain living alpine parrot. Fantastic stuff. A uh, little, uh, little fantail, it's a little fairy wren, it's a unique little bird, it's found only on New Zealand. Um, the reason why I'm throwing this in here is that I want to talk about some of the conservation programs. The first is that New Zealand has some very strict laws about the environment. There's a lot of regulation. If you're a libertarian, you're not going to like New Zealand at all. <laughs> because all these laws are designed to protect and preserve the very unique fauna that lives there. there most of this, in fact, all of the species that are living in New Zealand are found nowhere else in the world, at least those that are still surviving. So I had a couple days to kill, so I did. Uh, I joined some people and did a little cave exploration. This is actually a river, like the River Styx. It's an underground river that goes two miles through a mountain. And in order to go on this, we had to have wetsuits made out of a certain type of neoprene so that certain types of chemicals wouldn't leach into the water. There was actually people that would monitor uh, this underwater, uh, this, this, uh, this cave to make sure that none of the stalactites were being damaged. And we even had to wear two layers of shorts in case somebody urinated in their pants. <laughs> Believe it or not, if you're in a wet seat, it kind of warms things up. Just to make sure that there wouldn't be any human effluent in the water. So there's a lot of very severe regulation. So here we are going through here. And this, once a week, this cave is monitored to make sure there's no damage, there's no upset to the little cave organisms that live in there. So again, a lot of regulation to help try to preserve what's there. Something else that New Zealand is doing is that they're phasing out um, harvesting of any natural trees. Um, there are several species of trees in New Zealand that were that are important or were important hardwoods. And New Zealand instead has been planting massive forests of Monterey pine and red cedar and a variety of other trees. In fact, the largest artificial forest in the world is in the uh, South Island of New Zealand. And that's because what they've done is just what were sort of sheep pastures at one time. They're planting with trees, and those trees are then managed and harvested and used for the timber industry so that the na native trees can be set aside for the environment. This is something called a cowrie tree here, K-A-U-R-I, which is the biggest tree in the world. We think our redwoods are the biggest, or actually the tallest. These cowrie trees, I've seen a diameter that's as big as a four-bedroom house. It's absolutely just completely gigantic. And cowrie wood, believe it or not, is one of the best woods to build with. That's a major problem, is because it doesn't decompose under most circumstances. In fact, cowrie wood now is being harvested from swamps. They're pulling out logs that are over 7,000 years old. When these things dry out, they cut them, and the wood looks like it's about a day or two old. It's absolutely fantastic wood. In fact, I was at like this little yuppie uh, kitchen store, and they had cowrie bowls that were carbon dated at being 5,500 years old and they're selling for 200 bucks a bowl. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. 
Um, also, all the birds in New Zealand are protected. You can't really go out and hunt with one exception, I'll show you that in just a second. So all birds have protection, and that's similar in the US. All non-game birds, if you're not a duck or a quail or a pheasant, you're pretty much protected, but in New Zealand they sort of extend that to just about everything. Um, this is the kiwi, this is a uh, spotted kiwi? Yeah, it's a spotted kiwi. Kiwi is the national bird, or sort of the emblem of New Zealand. And this is gonna sort of go into sort of the next phase. Oh yeah, this is, sorry, I, Got to throw in a little interesting tidbit because I want you to go home learning a little something. Uh, the kiwi produces the largest egg per body size of any egg laying in the world. The egg can be one third the body weight. That's like a 180 pound woman giving birth to a 60 pound baby. So, this is an x ray of a gravid uh, kiwi. But um, in just about every town in New Zealand, they have a Kiwi House. And the Kiwi House is a major area of education, and it's also a major area of conservation, because these are areas where if there's an injured Kiwi, they take it, it gets fixed, it gets better. They also breed Kiwis for reintroduction programs into the wild. And the Kiwi is this bird that's totally unique to, to New Zealand, and the, and the New Zealanders absolutely love these birds. And so you'll see school groups just coming in, piling in every day, some school group from somewhere around in, in that, that region, coming into the Kiwi House, and they have these very detailed learning programs to teach the public. So in terms of birds, New Zealand is probably the most educated country in the world, which I think is fantastic because you talk to these people, and they know so much about their wildlife. They know so much about how important it is and how to protect it. Uh, this is an island. <clears throat> Uh, in a, a small island in the North Island of, of New Zealand where they have uh, released kiwis into the wild to try to propagate them. And one of the major predators on kiwis are actually dogs. And so they have these signs up. And if you're caught with your dog there, I think it's like a $10,000 fine. In some cases, I might actually put your dog down and teach you a lesson. But yeah, it's sad if you're a dog owner. But the problem is, out of, uh, out of I think, six kiwi species, two are already extinct and all the rest are very severely endangered. Now, in those museums, there's always a display about uh, these two critters here. These are public enemies number one and two. And as horrible as this looks, I'm going to show you what those public enemies are. Right here, this is the ferret. People think ferrets are cute. Ferrets are probably the second most destructive animal ever to be introduced to New Zealand. They, most of the birds in New Zealand evolved without any mammalian predators. They have no idea how to defend themselves, how to defend their eggs, and ferrets are absolutely the worst menace in terms of preying on the adults, eating the babies, eating the eggs. There have been some studies done showing that in areas where ferrets have, have inhabited, 90% of the bird species have been completely wiped out because of ferrets. This is why ferrets are banned in California. Now you get these pet owners that are always whining and complaining about why the ferrets are illegal. That's because New Zealand has, again, very similar climates and ecosystems. We have different birds than they do. But they're afraid that if ferrets get established in California, the same thing's going to happen. Now, we have other mammalian predators, fortunately, so the toll on the bird species may not be as bad. But, for example, if you like California quail, you're going to kiss them goodbye because these birds, these animals, excuse me, prey on ground nesting birds. Ferrets are evil little animals. Yeah, they're cute. But if you really like animals, you don't want to have ferrets. You definitely don't want to legalize them in California. But this is public enemy number one. I have never seen any, any organism, human or otherwise, more reviled in New Zealand than this animal. This is something called the brush-tailed possum. The brush-tailed possum normally lives in Australia. And somebody thought it would be a, <clears throat> a good idea if they imported these to New Zealand and let them go, let them populate, and then the New Zealanders could harvest them for their, their fur. And they have an incredibly soft pelt. It is <clears throat> finer than merino wool. Again, the problem is that there are no mammalian predators, in, no native mammalian predators in New Zealand, and these things live in the trees and ferrets don't climb trees. So it's estimated that there are 70 million brush-tailed possums in New Zealand, and the populations are increasing, and they consume 28,000 uh, tons of vegetation every single night. So they are eating the native trees that the birds live in. They also compete, for the bir uh, compete with the birds by eating seeds and berries. And there have been some recent work <clears throat> with surveillance cameras set up at bird nests showing that these raid the nests of birds. 
New Zealanders hate these animals, and this is the only reason why rifles are still legal in New Zealand, because they want citizens to own them to shoot these animals on sight. I am not kidding. I saw a children's book. <laughs> children's book in New Zealand, you know, we have here like, you know, little Jimmy's first trip to the zoo or, you know, little Patricia's, you know, first, you know, fair, country fair or something like that. They had a little book about this kid's first possum hunt. And the kid's just, you know, holding these things up and they talk about how to set snares and how to throw, uh, thank you very much, you know, how to, uh, you know, uh, put out poison bait for these animals. New Zealanders hate them and for a very good reason. Fortunately, a lot of them are killed off uh, by cars. I actually didn't see any live possums, mostly because they're nocturnal, but I counted about 2,000 dead ones on the highways of New Zealand. Right there. So you can see there's a, little, there's a little brushy tail right there. Uh, I love roadkill. I'm like geeky. They are very soft after they've been hit by a car. They're not that soft after about two weeks of the road. <laughs> New Zealand also has some very interesting reptiles. There are species of geckos that are found there and nowhere else in the world. And unfortunately, there is yet another little threat. And I don't have a picture of it, but it's a hedgehog. Everybody's seen hedgehogs, right? They're another very popular yuppie pet here in California that is also against the law to own for very good reason. These, um... Most of the reptiles in New Zealand live on the ground or in very low brush. And most of them are different types of slow-moving lizards that are eaten by hedgehogs. It's been shown now through studies that hedgehogs are probably responsible for eliminating half of the native insect species in New Zealand. That's thousands of species of insects that are now extinct because of hedgehogs. Are they fast? Hedgehogs aren't fast, but a lot of these, again, these insects evolved in, in this sort of nice, warm, fuzzy little um, cradle of New Zealand that didn't have a lot of mean animals running around trying to eat you. So we actually had weevils. Anybody, anybody know what a weevil is? It's, it's a beetle with a long kind of pointy nose. They had weevils that were about four inches long. Giant weevils that just sort of lumbered around the ground, and they all got munched by, uh, by hedgehogs. It's kind of a bad scene. But there is some good in all this, is that the New Zealand government is very conscientious about um, saving what is left. And the, one of the first things they've done is just try to eradicate all the ferrets, the weasels, brush-tailed possums, cats, dogs, everything that's non-native that's destroying the native wildlife. And I commend them quite heartily. This is a um, program that was actually, um, the concept was developed by that friend of mine, Frank Todd, who um, bred condors. One of the things they wanted to do when they bred condors is that they reared them in the lab. Now, birds have this ability to do what's called double clutching. That when the female lays her first batch of eggs, if you take those away from her quickly enough, she'll lay a second batch. So what um, bird biologists have done is steal that first set, raise them in the lab, she'll lay a second set and raise them. So you're getting basically sort of two batches of birds for the price of one. <laughs> the problem is when they were raising these baby condors in captivity, they didn't want to have them imprint on people. So they'd raise them in an area where um, people would be behind sort of, uh, you know, uh, glass panels or two-way, one-way mirrors, two-way mirrors, whatever. They have in liquor stores and prisons. Um, and they would raise the baby with a little puppet, a little puppet that looked like a condor mom, and they'd feed it little bits of food. Well, this is a bird called a tekahe, which was so rare that it was believed to be extinct for about 150 years until 1947. Somebody found a tiny little population on the top of one of the mountains. So they started doing this double clutch program where they'd find the females on the nest, steal some of her eggs, bring them in, and raise them in captivity. And so this is a little, a paper mache uh, mom brooder that has the uh, incubator under here and then a little puppet uh, that's raising this baby. And they've brought the population up to, I think, about 2,000 birds from what was believed to be maybe 14 to 20 birds, which is fantastic. Uh, this is an island I went to uh, in the South Island of New Zealand. This is a project that they've been doing quite a bit of recently and they've had very good luck. What they'll do is pick an island and go through and eradicate every non-native species. The rats, the mice, weasels, ferrets, hedgehogs, whatever. Once that island is sterile of non-native animals, they will then introduce um, native birds and try to get them to breed. And on this island they had this little guy here, this cute, this cute little fellow, and this is the male. This is called a South Island Robin. It's a bird that's maybe about as big as a marshmallow but with a little tail at the end of it. In this island, they introduced five females and three males. That's eight birds. Five years later, they had 200 of them on the island. 
And what they've done is do this on different islands. And the problem is that if you have you know, that many small ones, you know, or that small of a population, you're going to get very little genetic diversity. So what they do is once that population gets big enough, they start trading between different islands so that the genetic makeup of that population is then very diverse. Um, some, of the other, some of the other ways they protect uh, protected birds in New Zealand, New Zealand is by sort of taking on a, just a new attitude about the bird. This is a bird called a kia, which is another mountain living parrot in New Zealand. And the kia actually is one of the few parrots that likes to eat meat. It's been known to kill sheep. Because, no, no, figure this out. During the time of the moas, you know those big giant birds? Well, when those big giant birds would die, who would eat them? In other parts of the world, you have vultures. They didn't have vultures in New Zealand, so the kias actually took on the role of being a vulture. It's this food source that no one else is eating. So, you know, one of the sort of ideas of evolution is that, you know, if there's sort of this niche, and you can do it, and you can survive and breed great. So, um, without moas, they've uh, been known to attack sheep. They eat other things like berries and seeds and fruits and grasses and things like that. Um, so that in the early years, these animals uh, were killed off by bounty hunters. You would get, you know, a couple New Zealand dollars for every one you shot. And in some years they would shoot 20 or 30,000 of these birds to the point where the populations were severely reduced. And, you know, the ranchers, hey, and they said, you know, that's great. The government now realizes that, you know, the number of sheep that they kill isn't that much. They reimburse farmers like $40 or so for every dead sheep, which is about, you know, what they're going to get in the wool and the meat, and let these birds survive. But Turns out that they, the populations have, have exploded and they've spread to areas where they're formerly eliminated. But because the populations are getting larger, people studying these birds have found out some very interesting things. One is that these birds go through sort of an acculturation process. They live in family groups like most parrots do, and they learn how to behave by hanging out with older members in that group. Uh, when they're small like this, sometimes they'll form these bands and grow up on their own, and they turn into these ruffians. <laughs> and when I say ruffians, let me tell you this. There is a ski resort in New Zealand where somebody had been vandalizing the cars. They had been uh, ripping the rubber gaskets around the windows. Any um, uh, vinyl roofs were completely shredded up. The rubber on the windshield wipers were taken off. Plastic was being chipped. Paint was being stripped off the cars. And they couldn't find out who did this until they set up video cameras. And they found out that when somebody would pull up in their car, they'd wait for the people to leave, and these little flocks of these birds would come, and for some reason, would vandalize the car. <laughs> the only reason people could think of why they did this is just because they need something to do. They're no longer living. They're no longer in a social group where they're interacting with you know, males and females of different ages and learning how to feed and blah, blah, blah. That they're sort of, some of these, these um, delinquents have formed these own groups and they really haven't learned how to be a parent. So. It's pretty wild. Anyway. They listen to role models. They might listen to rock and roll. And I bet you they're smoking some stinkweed, too. <laughs> I forgot why I threw this in. This is a bird called, how uh, are these names? Are, this is a wika. Uh, this is a flightless bird. Uh, again, a lot of birds in New Zealand don't really fly because they didn't have anything really to fly away from. Uh, this bird was actually in such large numbers that they were hunted as mattress stuffing. That people, they, would, they would shoot tens of thousands of these birds and take the feathers and stuff mattresses in them to the point where somebody realized, well, I don't have a mattress business anymore because you can't get the birds. So, um, again, these are protected and the major predator now of these animals are dogs. And so the areas where these animals live, dogs don't live. Uh, this is another bird that's protected in New Zealand. This is called a little blue penguin. And this is one that's molting, and it's shedding the feathers, and so it's not kind of looking all that pretty right now. But it does have this sort of uh, kind of bluish cast on the top, and the Maoris used to make soup out of these. Uh, later on, when the Europeans got there, they would actually catch these birds by the thousands and melt them down for their fat that they would use for tallow and candles and things like that. Um, so the populations are pretty low, but the New Zealand government has, has done a pretty good job at protecting the populations. But I was there one day when somebody's dog got loose, went into a colony, and killed 54 of these penguins in a single night. 54. So they sent a forensics team actually to go out and get dog saliva off these birds so they could try to find out whose dog it was. Which, it was pretty sad, because, I mean, they killed 54 adults that were on the nest, and so all the babies that were there probably also died. Pretty sad. Um, there are some better stories. This is a little bird called a kakariki. It's a little, um, little parakeet-like bird. There it is, right here. It's a cute little one. I used to raise these as a kid. Um, when I grew up, I raised birds with my dad. I raised over 200 different species of birds, and this is one of them. 
Uh, this bird has actually done quite well through habitat enhancement. I talked about how New Zealand is no longer logging some of their native forests and how they're trying to get rid of the brush-tailed possum that eats the, uh, the native plants. Uh, in these areas where they've managed to do that, this bird has, has been doing quite well. The populations at one time were very, very low, and with just about 20 years of conscientious management, the population has really done incredibly well. All right, I'm going to shift you to just the last thing before the break. And that's a, a very interesting program that involves economy and people and conservation that, again, is, is one of these great programs that New Zealand has done to protect the wildlife and to educate the people. This is outside of a town called Napier. No relation to <laughs> Jack Napier at all. Uh, Napier was destroyed by an earthquake in about 1931, completely destroyed. And so the town was rebuilt. And oddly enough, they got somebody who was an art deco architect from Santa Barbara to come up and rebuild the town. So the town has these fantastic examples of California art deco architecture. <laughs> right here. There's another one here, the Daily Telegraph. Fantastic California art deco stuff. I just had to throw that in because it's like the coolest town I've ever seen. It is, I mean, it's just. I, they have another um, couple shots of the downtown. It's just like blocks and blocks. And blocks. How are the mixed drinks there? <laughs> um, the drinks are great. Alcohol is cheap in New Zealand, and there's like <laughs> microbrew everywhere. Every town has its own brewery. It's fantastic stuff. Actually, in the other place, can I go back? I actually did get a martini set uh, from this place here, the Deco Shop, that has the emblem of the town, which is a sort of um, sort of nouveau style um, woman. I have on the uh, martini drink side. So thank you very much for bringing booze back into the fold. <laughs> All righty. Just outside of Napier is a colony of this bird called the gannet. The gannet is a seabird that's related to the boobies that we have here in North America. Boobies! <laughs> Everybody likes boobies. Uh, but they're, they're rather stately looking birds. And the conservation department has worked with uh, the uh, local tourist board uh, to come up with a, with a way for people to enjoy and understand these birds, to make some money for the local community, and turn some of that money back around into conservation programs. So what you do is you get on these tractors with these wagons. They pull you up to this area here. Now, this is only accessible at low tide. And you go along the base of these cliffs, and around the cliff is a colony of birds. And it's not just a colony of birds. It's several tens of thousands of these birds. And if anybody's ever had birds before, they know that, well, bird duty don't smell so great. So when you got, you know, 40,000 of these birds, the stench is absolutely overwhelming to most people. I found it strangely pleasing in some way. So, but this is a, a way, this is, I think, a, a great way for um, these birds to be sort of seen and understood and studied as sort of basic ecotourism at, at sort of its, its most pristine. And so these birds are breeding. There's a little baby right there looking kind of grizzled and ugly. But, uh, but it's a great program. Now what I'm going to talk about after the break are some things that aren't so great and what we're doing at the California Academy of Sciences to try to uh, make things a little bit better. We have a couple cooperative programs going with some developing nations. And we're going to see uh, opium fields. We're going to go into the deepest heart of Africa. And we're going to talk about the original basis for Apocalypse Now, and it's not Heart of Darkness. So we're going to take a little break. I know it's a school night, so don't sneak out because the best stuff is yet to come. Everybody yeah. <laughs> done the karaoke? Yay! I was told to move over to this side. Yay! Sorry, you don't like looking at my arse? <laughs> Okay. My sexy butt. My sexy butt. All righty. Everybody liquored up, ready to go? It sounds like a frat house for guys. So go back over here? Okay. All right. All right. The ass section over here. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't see the pictures. All righty. Did anything I say make sense the first time around? Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll go over it. There's animals and stuff happens, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not. So, back section. All righty. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Asia now. Um, I'm going to do a little, little wheel on Asia, and then I'm going to talk about uh, 
sort of a, a shining star, or as Oscar Wilde said, a stream of bat's piss, which stands out like a shaft of gold when all around is dark. So we're going to talk about the little tiny island nation of Sao Tome. So first we're going to um, talk about some recent uh, trips or trip uh, to uh, Burma and Laos. And uh, I've actually got a crew sitting in back that uh, was there with me, so I can't lie. And I'm sure if I say anything incorrect, they're drunk and belligerent enough to let you know. So, um, Asia right now is going through some very uh, serious ecological problems. And that's because the um, economic development of the country is proceeding uh, to get in line with, uh, say, like North America, where there is a burgeoning middle class, and so there's a greater need for resources. More importantly, export dollars uh, have become very important for the economy of a lot of the Asian countries. So as a result, wildlife has suffered tremendously throughout most of Asia, primarily because of China. And I don't mean to single out the country, but let me mention this. China recently had a ban on logging in its country because their logging practices were so horrible that there were several gigantic landslides that wiped out sort of whole villages that they had a moratorium on logging. As a result, they're getting logs from their neighbors. They're getting logs from Vietnam, Laos, Burma, and uh, also Russia. So I actually got involved in a project in Burma. Oh, let me go to this slide here. This is uh, sort of another sad problem. Is that uh, wildlife is being poached and sold as skins or quite often sold as food into China. China has depleted a lot of their wildlife because of their um, uh, cuisine and so they're also relying on neighboring countries to supply wildlife that has become scarce or in some cases entirely eliminated in their own country. Are those pelt trading cards behind us? Those, uh, those pelt, I don't know what those trading cards are. Thank you very much. I, I'm not really sure. That's the first time I really noticed it. Uh, but there's uh, two leopards, there's a clouded leopard, part of the python skin there at that uh, trader's uh, little... Anyway, this is uh, what's called the Golden Triangle, and uh, it's not out of focus. You folks have just had a little too much to drink. Uh, but it's uh, Burma, Laos, uh, Thailand, and China that form an area that's called the Golden Triangle because of the um, propensity for opium-related uh, products. And more importantly, this area encompasses many uh, very unique habitats and also has uh, some very interesting and unique animals that also live in these habitats. Here we go. So an area that I recently had a chance to explore is Burma. And uh, two of my uh, Burmese comrades, and actually a third, is going to be going on our death march later on <laughs> this winter. We have to walk 120 miles each direction. Is that right, Joe? Yeah, going, man. Yeah, okay, we've got to walk up uh, Burma's highest peak yeah. on trails that are so narrow that most donkeys can't even get up it. Uh, and I'm thinking, I need this beer belly. <laughs> 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 uh, Burma is actually, Burma is actually a, a, very, a very ancient culture. And the country has changed its name from Burma to the Union of Myanmar. Myanmar, the R denotes a, a shortened last vowel. Um, because there are many different cultures that live in Burma presently. And the Burmans comprise the central core of the country, but there are outlying states that surround um, the Burmese majority that are composed of many different cultures. And so Myanmar is a way to sort of bring those groups together, sort of like calling all of Europe France, and everybody's pissed off at France because their own, their own cultural group isn't really well recognized. Well, there are still um, many different uh, rebel groups that are fighting for control of their states to try to establish uh, unique homelands. But uh, this was our beer of choice. There are only, what, two beers made in Burma? I'll just explain. They're actually pretty good. Uh, I'll explain why. Uh, so this is a propaganda billboard uh, that shows the unification of the many different cultural groups that are in Burma. And some of these cultural groups are very, very diverse because you get China to the north, Thailand to the south, uh, Laos to the east, and, Burma, and, and India and Bangladesh to the west. So just those areas represent sort of the cultural origins of many, many different groups that have sort of coalesced into what we call Burma or Myanmar today. So this is sort of the, the happy picture of, of what's going on. <laughs> are those poppies? Those are, you'll see poppies. 
And uh, this woman is characteristic of, uh, of the dress of some of the hill tribes. Most people in Burma uh, don't necessarily dress like this. This woman is out actually at the zoo. You pay a certain amount of uh, money to get your picture taken with her. But she does represent uh, a very sort of unique and very different cultural group. It's, you got to make money somehow. Uh, most of Burma is Buddhist. The primary religion in Burma is Buddhism, or at least what's officially recognized as such. And they love their Buddha. The temples are absolutely fabulous and completely stunning. Uh, this is the um, uh, major uh, pagoda in central Yangon, which was called at one time Rangoon. And it's so gigantic, you can't get it all in one shot. So this is just a segment of it. And there are literally um, tons of gold on the uh, major uh, turret of this pagoda. How many tons of gold, Joe? No, not tons. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of pounds because you can hammer gold down very thin. <laughs> the other major religion that isn't really recognized as such are the Nats. And the Nats are an animist religion. Uh, that is comprised of, I think, 37 different gods, and each god has sort of a different function. The Nats control sort of the daily life of the Burmese. Now, the Nat religion at one time was suppressed by the Buddhists, and it remained very strong in the religion, so the Buddhists actually rectified this by actually having Buddha as the 38th and sort of the king of the Nats. <laughs> the Nats are a very interesting group. There are different Nats that serve different functions. There are actually two different Nats that are little godlets of drinking. So two different booze-related Nats. Uh, this right, some of the Nat religions involve uh, excessive drinking and eating and smoking and playing of loud music and even transvestitism. Yeah. And, but the, um, the Burmese take this religion very, very seriously, because as Joe was telling me, they pay homage to Buddha for the afterlife, but for the present life, they really have to obey the Nats, or else if you offend them, they will cause mischief in your life. So they can cause all manner of potential harm or impedance to your life. And uh, I actually put this to the test. Um, this is a little altar to the water buffalo goddess, who is uh, sort of one of the, the major Nats. She's sort of a giver of life and controller of the waters. Uh, for the uh, southern end of the uh, delta in, in Burma. And I got uh, food poisoning from eating some seafood that was really bad. And so I put the little flowers at the base of her altar. And sure enough, 24 hours later, I was better. Could have been just the fact that I had sort of pooped everything out. I was better anyway. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, she's very popular. Uh, this is downtown Yangon. And unlike, say, like Bangkok, where you have just acres and acres of massive skyscrapers, uh, there are very few, very tall buildings. I actually liked Yangon because it was kind of a, a run-down post-colonial uh, disaster. It actually has this sort of beautiful um, feel to it. Um, many of these cultures are represented in the, op the open-air markets. Uh, people have said if you really want to see a culture, you go to the markets and you can see things like this. These are giant water beetles. These are bugs that are about four inches long. They're actually roasting soul food. Yeah. Yeah. They're quite yeah. right and Burma is actually sort of lagged behind a number of more industrialized countries because they've taken this position of self-reliance where they want to promote their own country without the interference of other countries. And as a result, uh, we eradicated polio decades ago, and this was something that was just taken last year, where our, the national duty is to eradicate polio. So some people consider Burma to be a relatively primitive country. But in many cases, that's good because it has not been highly industrialized or modernized. Uh, this is the Ministry of Industry. If the bigger industries ever goes to Burma, this is who they'd have to register with. Uh, most of the products, uh, the food, the machinery in Burma is made by Burmese companies. Although in, uh, in the last decade, there have been more uh, imports from different Asian countries. But this uh, idea of self-reliance is very important. And also the idea of, of being um, self-reliant on yourself and not reliant on the ideas of other interlopers such as the US government you see this thing here called the people's desire and this is printed every day in the newspaper and there are billboards in both uh, Burmese and in English and it says oppose those relying on external elements acting as stooges holding negative views number, one. <laughs> number two oppose those trying to jeopardize the stability of the state and progress of the nation Number three, oppose a foreign nations interfering in internal affairs of the state. 
It's sort of a jab at the U.S. And crush all inter in, uh, internal and external destructive elements as the common enemy. Yeah! <laughs> now, Burma is very interesting because the British um, basically took it over, more or less, in about 1840 or so, and uh, ruled it until the Japanese occupation uh, in the late 30s and early 40s. And it wasn't until the end of the war when the Burmese people actually rose up and took control of their own country because they had been dominated by the Japanese and before that the British, uh, they had a very sort of xenophobic view. Uh, and again, this is, I don't want to say good, but it's beneficial because there are more um, habitats that are available to study than a lot of other Asian countries that have been more highly modernized and thereby have destroyed a lot of the habitat. Uh, we work with, I don't know if this is backwards or forwards because I have, have a hard time reading for me. Uh, we work with a uh, branch of the forestry department, Joe, is that right? That's right. That's right, thank you. Uh, wildlife Division. And we have a, um, here he is, here's Joe right here. I, re I uh, got involved in this Burma project um, because of this guy right here and that guy right over there. This is uh, Dr. Joe Slowinski, Cobra Joe. All right. Uh, Here. Was this? Donna. The Donnas? We had a great CD collection. We had the Ramones, the Donnas, the Sex Pistols, X, uh, Dick Dale, some old rockabilly. So the Burmese got a really weird taste about what American rock and roll is. Uh, but Joe uh, has a three year project to study the reptiles of Burma because Burma has basically been closed for. Since, since before World War II, and before that, a lot of the area hadn't really been surveyed well, there is potentially a lot of new species, or more importantly, species that are known that aren't very well mapped. So Joe got involved, later invited me to take part with the, the bird and mammal branch of it. He's studying the reptiles. He's found a uh, new species of cobra, and how many other new species of snakes? Yeah, got four new species of snakes, about 20 frogs, a lot of things. A lot of things. <laughs> and that's what you get for doing a lot of hard work and investigating areas that nobody has really investigated for probably the last 100 years or so. More importantly, we're working with the Burmese government to train a field team because the universities have basically been closed since 1994 because you get democracy going on in universities and when you have a military junta, who needs democracy? So they close down the colleges. And so the field team is being educated in ecology, biology, systematics, all that stuff you need to know to understand and manage uh, biological populations. And hopefully these people will be put in different branches of the government so they can make wise choices. More importantly, the information that we're learning about the wildlife in Burma is being used for better management plans. So if the government wants to set aside an area for protected habitat or wants to open up an area for logging, they will have... Um, much more concrete information about what areas might have endangered species or what areas are important breeding areas uh, for certain animals. It was very important. Um, a lot of central Burma was uh, rice paddies. And at one point, Burma actually exported more rice around the world than any other country. Uh, since then, rice exports have lagged. And some areas that were rice paddies at one time had uh, have slowly become um, reclaimed by, by nature. Now the rice paddies um, produce a couple things. Rats and mice eat rats, snakes eat rats. And so this uh, type of snake, this is a uh, cobra, one of the more easily recognizable animals. <laughs> Most little kids can identify what this is. But these live in close proximity to people because people are living in the rice paddies, they're farming there. Um, there is a high density of cobras and people. And because of that, Burma actually has one of the highest per capita ratios of snake bite and death of any place in the world. In fact, the three major causes of death in Burma are snake bite, malaria, and dysentery, I believe. Um, but cobras aren't really that bad. I mean, Joe will, I've seen Joe pick these things up, probably with his teeth after a couple Myanmar beers. Um, but what are, what are worse is a species called the Russell's viper. And unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the Russell's viper here. But cobras oftentimes do what's called a sham strike, where they'll sort of strike at you but not inject venom or not even really bite. Um, oftentimes when they hear you coming, they'll flee or they'll lay low. The Russell's vipers tend to be a little more aggressive and have much more potent venom. And so uh, I think Joe was telling me that 80% uh, of the snake bite fatalities are Russell's vipers. Or... You should come up here, Joe. We'll, we'll do a tag team. <laughs> 
What I was kind of scared of, and Joe told me that I was a wuss because of this, are these little green tree vipers here. Because when you're walking on the paths, they tend to be in the, the bushes, on the edges of the paths, right by your head. And every one of these I saw our field team catch were sort of eye level, sort of right there on the side of the path. These things won't kill you, but if they bite you in the face, your head will swell up like a big red rock. Which isn't something you want to have happen to you. Now, again, to put things into perspective, um, the field team, I think last year, collected about 2,000 snakes, and which is the basis for um, most of the scientific research that's being done on reptiles or in Burma. There are really no other institutions in the California Academy of Sciences. But Joe estimated, I'm putting him on the spot again, that about a million snakes are being shipped out every year to China as food. And this is uh, just a, a single day at a snake processing and shipping station. Each one of these bags has dozens and dozens of snakes that are bound for China. And there's also a little, um, Little, looks like a little jungle cat or maybe a little fishing cat or something like that. It'll probably end up at a restaurant in China as well. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this is our field team. We're heading out into the field, uh, going through some areas on the west coast of Burma, through some mountains that superficially look like it might be great habitat. Look at this. Look how green it is. But this is actually all bamboo. This is probably an area that had been deforested. Uh, decades ago, and when the bamboo grows in it, it's like crabgrass in that it dominates the terrain and prevents other plants from really getting in there. So you get this monoculture, just one type of plant that will support a very low diversity of wildlife. So as pretty as this looks, this is relatively sterile. Sort of bad news. Well, <clears throat> well our first field site was great. It's actually a resort on the beach in the Bay of Bengal. And we would uh, uh, either hike out from here or drive to field sites and spend time hiking and looking around. Um, and then come back and measure and weigh and process the different specimens. These are uh, different sea snakes here, highly venomous sea snakes. Uh, these are members of our field team that are skilled in the proper identification and scientific data collection of these specimens. And these are my first leaf bites. I got these pale girly legs. Isn't it kind of embarrassing? <laughs> but these, these are forest leeches. These aren't leeches in the water. These are leeches that actually crawl in the forest, and they will crawl up your, crawl up your leg and down your sock. And I didn't actually feel them bite because they have an anesthetic in the saliva. Actually, Joe was hiking in front of me, and Dom pointed him out, and Joe like, pulled down his socks, and it's all bloody. And I'm like, oh, that is so gross, dude. But I looked at my own legs, and I counted there are 14 different bites. And the saliva also has an anticoagulant, so I'm sort of you're dripping blood for a couple days. It's pretty bad. And then those scabbed up, and then I later went hiking on, on another trip, and then there were little flies that were eating the scabs. <laughs> Um, when we're out in the field, um, sort of doing field studies, the locals are always very eager to participate. So they'll tell you areas where they've seen animals. They'll want to come and, and, and know what you're doing, and we always make pains to try to explain what we're doing and why it's important. And then oftentimes they'll start bringing stuff. And sometimes they'll be knocking on your, your, your tent or on your door, you know, late at night. Um, one night after I went to bed, somebody brought this by. This is a pangolin. A pangolin is a weird animal that looks superficially like a reptile, but it's actually a true mammal. And this was actually going to be uh, shipped over to China, I was told, that they wanted to sell it to us because it was a shorter walk to the place where they were going to be shipped to China. <laughs> so we got this thing for, I think, about 20 bucks, and they were, it said that it, it can, Dong, I think, was telling me it can fetch about $200 at a banquet in China. But what's interesting is that this represented the first record for this entire mountain range in Burma. Again, one of the things I said about biodiversity surveys is just going in to see what the heck is there. And so this specimen that was brought to us by some locals at like 11.30 at night represented the first known occurrence of this entire mountain range in western Burma. I was not able to find any records of this animal in the past hundred years of scientific research there. Does pretty amazing. Yes. Do, do you have like tons of reference books with you? I mean, to like see if this has been the. You read up as you much do. as you can. You bring xeroxes of some of the most important things, and then you take notes, and then you usually go back and sort of reread stuff you should have read or should have brought with you. So you don't know sometimes if you get it whether it's just business as usual or. Sometimes it. You, sometimes like, yeah, it's something yeah. looks the same, and then you bring it back and you figure out, hey, it's kind of different. Like uh, some of the frogs from Burma, the frog fauna isn't very well known. A lot of the frogs are kind of the same. So you get six kind of brown looking frogs, and then you sort them back in the lab, and it turns out, you know, they're actually 12 different species or something. 
So where is that little guy now? That little guy is residing in the Department of Ornithology and Mammalogy at the California Academy of Sciences. Oh. Hey! It gave its body for science. That animal right now has documented the existence of that species. That, that's, it's, it was euthanized, humanely. Now you're laughing. But that is, it's, it is a relatively uncommon animal that is indicative of healthy old growth forests. Did you take a bite? I didn't eat, oh, you'll see something else we eat later. <laughs> anyway, um, we later then hiked into some of the mountains, and we had elephants when we started, and I thought, oh, great, I'll be riding an elephant. Turns out, no, the elephants are from packing the stuff in, and i got to drag my ass, uh, what, 15 miles or so, uh, into this place called Elephant Camp. And these are little little elephants in training with little mahouts in training. This is a little, little guy named 912, and 912 was a mahout in training, and they start the kids and the elephants off small so they can learn and develop sort of as a team as they go on. So he was a cute little guy. And so here's the elephants at elephant camp and this was sort of our home base. Um, these are forestry service officials that live there and they cooperated in doing some of the scientific investigations. There is a second team of elephants. This is the Myanmar timber industry elephants which are Big, tough, kick-ass elephants with these tough guys here. That, they got drunk one night with us, dancing with the Donna, swinging their machetes, doing the monkey dance, just having a great time. Well, I was told not to pet this elephant. Um, anyway, one of the things I was uh, studying in Burma was a Yeah, okay, here's the product, product placement right there. groups of mammals in the world. There's about 920 different species of bats around the world. And bats are extremely important for reasons that most people don't understand. First is that they are major insect eaters. A single bat might eat 200 mosquitoes in a single day. Mosquitoes are vectors of yellow fever and malaria and a variety of other things. So bats as insect control are very important. Fruit-eating bats are also very important because when they eat fruit, they will up ingest the seeds, and as they fly into different areas, they will defecate those seeds out into areas. And they're oftentimes the primary group that introduces the first generation of new plants into areas that have been deforested. So identifying what species of bats live in an area, how dense they are, and where the different roosting and sleeping areas are, are very important for then maintaining those populations and understanding their importance in both the natural world and in the human world. So we spent uh, we spent a week at elephant camp doing work with birds and bats, and Joe got quite a few cobras. Then we went up the Gua River. Uh, Joe wanted to the find Gwar? some the Gua, and not Guar. Although <laughs> well, I think there's some spewing later on in the trip, just like Guar. But this is the Gua River, which um, had um, rumors of saltwater crocodiles, which is a species of crocodile that is rare in many parts of its range. Um, Simple dugout canoe with a V8 engine that had a drive shaft with a propeller at the end of it that's sort of um, just hanging on a little bamboo platform down there. And you can see the gas tank right there. You're gonna see this, you're gonna see this tank a little bit later on at the end of the show, and it's gonna be quite hilarious. Uh, this is our field team. This is uh, Toon Win, who's the big boss man. Uh, this is La Toon. Uh, this is Thin Thin, who is, she is a snake-catching wizard. She sees snakes that nobody else sees. Uh, and this is Mr. Malaria, San <laughs> Um Malaria, the group I went with, uh, almost everybody got malaria but me. Uh, Joe got malaria, Don picked up three strains of malaria, got the fourth with me in Africa. Um, and uh, most of the Burmese actually have it as a, chron as a chronic condition. What does malaria do? Malaria makes you very ill. You puke. You go through uh, chills and fevers, and uh, you can actually die from it. In fact, one of the one of the part one of the parties a year before, two people on the, the field team died. Pretty pretty serious stuff. And what's important is that in Burma, some of the first anti-malarial medications were uh, developed and instituted by the British. And so the first strains of medicine-resistant malaria have also showed up. So it's some pretty serious stuff. Yeah, gin and tonics, originally the, uh, the quinine was supposed to help uh, keep the malaria away. So that's why we drink a lot of gin and tonics. And I recommend everybody else to do so. 
Uh, I don't know why I threw this in here. It's just a cool picture of a guy flattening his rice paddies. Uh, uh, after we came back from the west coast, we then headed east. Uh, this is the uh, is this the temple in in Bogo? I think it's the temple in Bogo, which is also utterly fantastic and absolutely gigantic, and it has this beautiful Burmese uh, Buddhist architecture to it. Um, this is really cool. This is a um, icon that's very popular in Burma, where the Buddha is being protected by this uh, cobra-like serpent. Pretty cool. But then you see some weird things that just don't fit in. <laughs> absolutely holy sites. <laughs> so his little eyes flap in. Pretty cool stuff. And then also uh, at these temples is a sort of real interesting racket that goes on. Uh, it's a Buddhist tradition to sort of gain karmic points by giving an animal its freedom. And so you can actually buy these birds and release them at the temples. Now, it, it, you have to fit in that these birds were originally caught to be released. But what I found was interesting is that when you release these birds at all of these temples, there are these little groups of crows that watch what you're doing and wait for you to release this bird that has been disoriented, it's kind of hungry, it's been in its cage for a while, its wing muscles aren't so strong, and the crows will come down and nab them. I was with a friend of mine at one of the, the uh, uh, temples in Yangon, and the first bird I released was picked up by this crow and gobbled down like a little marshmallow. But uh, there you go, it's part of the, part of the Hindu culture. And then the gnats. I believe this was a gnat shrine. We couldn't really figure out what the heck this was. This is uh, Dong, a photographer here. Um, when you go into a town, the different temples will have little stands where they're playing music or banging drums, and they will solicit donations for the upkeep of that temple. We had this little guy, this little dog-headed demon that was doing somersaults and bouncing off the wall, and there was this racket, like some sort of subgenius woke hand that just going and going. And I love this guy. Dong and I just stopped and got out of the car, and we were just taking pictures of this guy and just laughing our asses off. And I think we must have given him like 20 bucks, which in Burmese money is, is a lot, an incredible amount. But this guy was just great. I just love that little dog-headed demon. We couldn't, I think he may have been one of the Nat religions, but we couldn't figure it out. Uh, we went past a, um, a uh, sort of a communal fish harvest. Uh, this is a village that uh, teamed together to drain one of the uh, fish farming ponds, and they were processing the different fish, sorting them into different species, different sizes, different buckets. And then there's this, this great little kid here who would go after the stray fish that tried to make it back out to, uh, to the undrained ponds. And then these fish are usually then uh, uh, salted and dried out and then used as food. And in some cases, if there's a surplus, it'll be sold at the markets to generate money for, for the village. Pretty cool. We headed east to a place called the Golden Rock, which is one of the most holy sites in all of Buddhism. Why do they call it the Golden Rock? <laughs> <laughs> because it rocks! <laughs> it's actually this giant boulder that's perched pretty precariously on another even gianter boulder. And it looks like it should tip off. It's in an area where that's renowned for earthquakes. Is that spray paint? That's not spray paint. I'll show you what that is in just a second. That is gold. That's gold leaf that's been put on by the uh, devotional uh, Buddhists. But you can see the size. There's a monk right there. It's believed that this boulder is held in place by a single hair of Buddha underneath. So it's, it is a site of, of extreme holiness. Although when I got there, it was, uh, <laughs> it was being clean. I'm trying to get that into focus. Yeah, this, this is one of Dom's slides from the year before. Then I get there, and it's, it's cleaning time for the golden rock. So, but it's still pretty beautiful because they painted the scaffolding gold to kind of go with it. But you can see here, when you go to the site, there's a pavilion on top. The walk itself up there, it almost killed me. I was being chided along by a Japanese, older Japanese man who I swear was involved in the Bataan Death March because he spoke Burmese and he was Japanese and he was goading me as an American. He said, you're too weak! You never make it! You're too fat! You're too fat! But I made it, dude! It's really sad when I'm like sitting there sweating trying to drink some water and there's like these like 70 year old Burmese ladies just whizzing by. But you get up there and there's this pavilion up top with, uh, with uh, there's like a dozen different shrines. It is absolutely beautiful. And you can buy little patches of gold leaf and apply it to the rock. And so these are people actually applying 
new layers of gold leaf. And you can see sort of above where the hand can reach, it's gotten a little dirty, which is why they got the scalp. Apply it with what? Excuse me? Apply it with what? Is there any adhesive? You, no, you kind of pat it on there, I guess. Did you take it all? Don't know how gold you works. Scrape layers layers off? You, you could scrape layers off. You would probably get beaten by a, a group that's normally a bunch of pacifists. So. <laughs> Something you don't want to do. In fact, I think Joe said, man, if you yeah, want to do it with, with a knife, you can scrape off a couple hundred bucks with the gold. <laughs> He didn't say it quite like that, but but it is it's an incredible place, and I'm I'm pretty much an atheist, and I was pretty moved. It was absolutely fantastic. Now on the way up, we actually went by a few um, huts that had native medicine involved, and this was a little bit alarming because we found many species that were endangered and are protected by Burmese law, but are used as part of the traditional medicine. So it's a problem where you have to rectify conservation laws with people's culture. Uh, this right here is the head of a uh, hornbill. Here's what a hornbill looks like. A beautiful bird that's uh, endangered in, in just about all of its range. And then also in this stall here, we have uh, legs of a leopard. There's a skull of a bear, which are endangered. There is uh, teeth of baby elephants here that are sold. Uh, all, and uh, this is elephant skin right here. Uh, we also saw a variety of other uh, protected and endangered animals that are used as part of the uh, traditional uh, medicine of these people. So again, you don't want to alienate a culture by saying what they're doing is wrong, but uh, in, in many cases coming up with an educational program and a management plan that will sort of work for both ways is what's optimal. Oh, well, yeah. outside of the Golden Rock, uh, we wanted to head into some, some good jungle. And we were in an area that was um, uh, very popular with the Karen rebels. The Karen are an uh, ethnic minority that want to have a um, homeland of their own. It's an area where some of the heaviest fighting in all of Burma has been. And somebody once said you could tell the psyche of a culture on its toys. And these are the toys that are for sale here. These are all made out of bamboo, but they're different uh, uh, rocket uh, grenade launchers, different types of machine guns. And these are all different sort of war toys that are uh, made and sold because of ongoing wars between the Karen rebels and the Burmese government. So when we were there, we had uh, military escorts with us. Uh, we had uh, somebody who was uh, one of the local police, and we think we also had a, a federal government soldier with us. And so these are the two people here with a uh, nice AK-47 right here and a nice beautiful M16. <laughs> they let you shoot them? No, they didn't let us shoot them, but they um, went fishing with one of the M16s. <laughs> yeah. uh, one morning, I heard this, <coughs> and I look up, and there's a guy who had shot into the pond, and the impact of the bullet on the water had stunned the fish, and he was sort of scooping these things to the surface. <laughs> actually, we brought some back for the, uh, the museum, so we have some of the fish that were actually collected using M16. But these were incredibly nice people. Um, something I cannot stress enough about the Burmese is that it's probably one of the nicest, sweetest, friendliest, most helpful and hardworking cultures I've ever been involved with. Everybody was so stinking nice all the time. Even the government soldiers were really nice. And some of the uh, local villagers had helped uh, schlep all of our scientific equipment up into the hill. So we were stationed here uh, overnight. And one of the things we found was this little guy here called the brush-tailed porcupine. And there's an interesting story about this. We went into this one um, giant boulder that was excavated underneath. It was basically a cave underneath a giant boulder and you had to squeeze in on your belly to get through. And I was about to go and I was told you shouldn't go in because this is oftentimes where king cobras like to den. And I thought, okay, you go first. So a couple of people went in there. Uh, me and one of the guards, uh, one of the uh, military officers were outside and I hear all this screaming and all this yelling. Four of our field guys inside screaming and yelling. And I go, well, is there a snake? Oh, no, no snake. Is there, are there bats? No, no, no bats. I found out that something in Burmese, if you ask them a question, they will give you the answer to that question. Not like, oh, no, there's not a snake, but there's this. <laughs> Turns out they scared this porcupine that was zipping around in this cave with a pitch black bouncing against him. It then pops out. It looks at me. I'm looking at it. I tap the soldier on the shoulder had his back to the entrance of the cave. He swung around, saw this thing, and screamed. Put the machine gun in his hand. Fortunately, it didn't go off. But we caught it. Here we are actually weighing the animal. And one of the things we had to uh, worry about is that the porters were so excited. I actually had to work out a deal with them. I said, we needed to get the scientific information from this animal. We needed to collect tissue samples and parts, and they could have the rest to eat. And they 
<laughs> Within seconds, they got the fire going and they got the porcupine on the sweat. And roasting the porcupine there. And Don and I had a bite of it, and it's pretty good, wasn't it? Very good. Very good. Alrighty. I'm sorry, what was the question? Why were they screaming? Why were who's? Oh, because it was a porcupine, and they, they're sharp. And all you have is your hands. Actually, how it was caught was an interesting story. The Burmese have this little sort of skirt called a longi. It's sort of like a little men's kind of half sarong thingy. And we're trying to figure out how to grab this thing, because they're, they're sharp, and they hurt. And I don't want to get hurt. And one of the guys actually pulls off his longi and wraps it around, like in this sort of, like this incredible move, and actually sort of tied the thing up, and then he had his little underwear on. <laughs> We, we, he got it. It was, it was fantastic. Does he like swing it against the ground and stuff to like kill the thing, or how, how, how did he actually kill it? It was uh, it was it was euthanized again. Okay. <laughs> we, have, we carry stuff with us. We are required by law to adhere to certain rules and regulations. But the same stuff that a vet puts your dog down with, we have little little jars of this stuff. Okay. You know what? If you shoot it, it'll ruin it. You'll destroy this the, the scientific information. You over the heavens, bottle. There was no beating on heads. Um, anyhow, this is um, one of the major problems that's happening with Burma now is that. It is generating a large portion of its economy by selling logs to China, which will then mill it down and send it back here to the U.S. If you look in the papers and if you go to places like uh, Rite Aid or Walgreens, you'll see that you can actually buy teak furniture now. Most of that teak is coming from Laos and coming from Burma. So if you care anything about the forest in Burma, you don't want to buy any teak. So we're, we are sort of in a race to explore areas that haven't been explored before they fall under the, uh, the saw of the loggers. And hopefully we'll try to get uh, coherent scientific information to present to the government so that they will start setting aside more potential habitats. So we're in Burma for about a month and then we went to Laos for a week. Now Laos is very interesting because there is the potential for a lot of incredible new research because Laos is even more uh, inaccessible than Burma is and has been closed for an even longer period of time. So this is the capital, Vientiane. In Laos, um, this is the market here. Actually, there were some bombings uh, about a week before we got there. Uh, so a lot of the people were pretty nervous, but it was, you know, sort of, again, one of your typical market scenes with all manner of uh, beast and fruit being uh, sold to the populace. And then we went to a central area here. I'm trying to get this thing focused. Uh, this is an area called the, the Northern Dry Zone in Laos. Uh, these dry zones are very interesting because these are dry, almost prairie-like habitats that are in the middle of tropical areas. And it's because of mountains surrounding these areas that cause what's called a rain shadow effect. Just like when you go to your little uh, your Labor Day desert event, your man thing. What is that? <laughs> when you cross over the Sierras, okay, those mountain ranges prevent these moisture-laden clouds from going over the Great Basin and raining. Uh, same here. There's one of these uh, central dry zones in Thailand. There's another one in Burma. There's one in northern Laos. And each one of these is sort of a restricted, unique little habitat that has all manner of uh, interesting and unique animals and plants associated with them. So this area in Laos is known for two major things. The first is one of the wonders of the archaeological world that's pretty much been forgotten by the West. And this is an area called the Plain of Jars. And these are some of the jars. They are large stone urns that have been carved out of whole rock by civilizations that have since gone extinct. And the use of these jars is unknown. Some people think they might be burial urns. Some people think they might be cremation receptacles. One of the uh, uh, Laotian um, explanations is that these were used to make rice wine, which you'll see a little bit later. Again, booze is worked back into the fold. Uh, some people have also surmised that these might be areas where they're storing rice, because in these dry areas, they're prone to wildfire. And if you stored your rice in your bamboo hut, the entire uh, year's crop would be burned up. So if they were stored in these containers, it might survive. Nobody really knows. We don't even know the date of these urns. They have not been adequately dated. Somebody dated some um, lacquer that was scraped up from one of the insides of the jars. It was dated to um, only a few hundred years old. Other people suggested they're well over 4,000 years old. Nobody really knows. And some of them are incredibly large, very large. Alrighty. The other reason why this area is known um, to the Western world is because this is where the U.S. waged a secret bombing campaign for about nine years during the Vietnam War. 
uh, in northern Laos, there is a group of uh, communist uh, rebels called the Pathet Lao, which are basically the Laotian version of the Viet Cong. In fact, they worked very close to one another. And this area is a major area for growing uh, food and grain that was then shipped to the Pathet Lao and even to the, um, the Viet Cong. So the U.S. bombed this area back to the Stone Age. That term you may have heard during the Vietnam War actually came from uh, one of the uh, U.S. military leaders saying they wanted to bomb Laos back to the Stone Age. Bombs away Kurt LeMay. <laughs> was that, is that who it was? That's who it was. Kurt, Kurt LeMay. Curtis LeMay. Wanted to bomb Laos back to the Stone Age. In this area, they did a very good job because there are no structures that we saw older than about 1972. Um, what you see here is, uh, these are bomb craters right here. This is uh, Cobra Joe. He stands a handsome, probably, what, 5'11", uh, 6 foot, something like that. You can see right here, single bomb crater. There's another one here. There's another one here. They're all over on the hillside. You can see all these little pop marks here. All of those little pop marks, those are all bomb craters. This area was also very dangerous to work in because there were still many unexploded bombs. In fact, on a per capita basis, this area, northern Laos, was the most heavily bombed area in the history of warfare. 2.3 million tons of bombs dropped in this area because it was so important for supplying food and supplies to the Pathet Lao and the, the Viet Cong. The U.S. waged a secret undeclared war um, that actually cost quite a few American lives. Um, some estimates have shown that the fatality rate was, uh, in some areas, 50% or more. Um, this guy here, is, is uh, he was our driver. Uh, this was our local guide because there are many areas where the bombs had not been cleared. In some of the areas that had been cleared, there were still unexploded bombs. And, um, and one day I found four cluster bombs, which are cute little sort of steel-looking baseballs that are designed to maim people and livestock, and two unexploded mortars. He used to be a driver for the, uh, the Viet Cong and the Pathet Lao. He would actually drive supplies to him. This was an incredibly cool guy. Uh, and this gentleman here uh, is the son of a, a hotel owner, and he takes um, visiting scientists and other uh, reprobates out uh, to show them the lay of the land, so to speak. Again, I'm having a hard time focus right here. Uh, you hear about uh, turning uh, swords out of plowshares. No, plowshares out of swords. Swords into plowshares. This is somewhat similar. These stakes that are holding up this water buffalo pen are the um, hulls of unexploded bombs, where the, the um, gunpowder has since been taken out and usually um, manufactured into other munitions by the uh, Pathet Lao or Viet Cong. These are unexploded um, gun, uh, bomb casings. Here's another bomb casing right here that actually has cactus growing in it. Um, one of the interesting traditions of the uh, Hmong, which, uh, which are the uh, village people in this area, is that they will have uh, cactus growing at the entrance of a uh, village, and it's because the ghosts will catch themselves on it. And in this area, because uh, so much of the population had been killed, there are ghosts all over the place, and so there's these little uh, little planters with cactus in them. Um, something that I have right here, we were actually eating lunch someplace uh, that day, and I was eating with this spoon, and it's like this strange kind of coarse metal. And I was eating, and, and the, um, the uh, driver I was with saw me kind of looking at the spoon, and he goes, it was American, American airplane. Oh, oh man. Yeah. What? Got an explanation out of him that um, some of the local villagers will still scavenge the downed aircraft. When we were out there, we saw uh, some leftover tanks. I saw part of a helicopter. The locals will go out and strip off the aircraft aluminum, smelt these down into little molds, and make spoons. So this spoon is the remains of a downed U.S. aircraft. I'm talking about turning swords into plowshares. You're turning U.S. military aeronautical technology into spoons for soup. And the thing is, if you hold this over your ear, you can hear the screams of the American uh, Pretty wild stuff. I thought it was cool, so I had to buy a couple of these. Um, anyway, um, this um, right here, this shrine was actually, um, we were taken here um, by our, our guide when we were sort of exploring this area. And this is probably one of the most tragic events uh, during the uh, secret bombing campaign. And this says right here, I, I'll try to read it for you, it says, deploring to the spirit of villagers who got uh, killed by rocket on 24-11-1968 from American imperialist. Yeah. I'll explain that to you. 
This was a cave that originally had an overhang on it, so you couldn't really see the cave from the outside. And this is where the villagers go when there would be an air raid. And so eventually it made it to US intelligence that whenever there is an air raid, the villagers would go here. So the US staged an air raid. The villagers piled up into there. 500 villagers piled in there. Two F-4 jets came by. One F-4 jet blew the rock that was overhanging here, thereby exposing the cave. This is the inside of the cave. The second F-4 fired a rocket that went in all the way to the back of the cave, exploded, killed all 500 people instantly. Not very good. Because of the massive amounts of munitions that are still in that area, um, you see these charts in just about every hotel and restaurant and school that shows you how to recognize different types of bombs, different types of rocket launch grenades, different landmines, both anti-vehicle landmines, anti-personnel landmines, different types of cluster bombs, uh, parachute bombs, uh, mortars, and a variety of other things here such as grenades. Oh, in this area, once a week, the government would go and collect all of the unexploded munitions that were found in that area that week and would blow them up. And we were actually out at one of the um, uh, Plain of Jars sites when they, we heard this explosion at the end of the valley and saw sort of a little white mushroom cloud. And our guide said, yeah, that's it. That's what they're blowing up for that week. Um, he told me that in that area, um, about a dozen people are killed every year uh, by stepping on unexploded bombs, which is down from about uh, 200 people a year in the 80s and about 1,000 people in the year in the 70s. Pretty, pretty revolting. Um, but this area is in the uh, Golden Triangle, and sometimes you got to stop and smell the flowers. <laughs> and this is just a little your basic neighborhood, you know, heroin grove right here. These are all opium poppies. They're beautiful. But I was very interested in the wildlife, because this is an area that has not been explored hardly at all. There are no books you can go look up about the wildlife or the ecology of northern Laos. And we found that unlike Burma, there was a huge diversity of wildlife that was for sale in the markets. Uh, on a single weekend, I counted 57 different species of birds and 14 different species of mammals, uh, plus, you know, untold species of frogs, uh, snakes, a variety of other things. Here, you get a beautiful golden pheasant. Here's a male, two females, and this is a civet, a cat-like animal, you'll see later. Here's another stall that has uh, Argus pheasants, female silver pheasants. There are uh, six different types of squirrels and more birds down there. Extremely diverse. The one good thing about this, it shows that the wildlife is still relatively abundant in many of these areas. The bad part is that the increasing human population is taking an increasing toll on these animals. <laughs> now, we didn't have any permits to collect there, so all we had to do was look. And one of the things that really interested me is that um, Michael talked about if you see, how do you know if you see something interesting. And I saw this bird that was for sale in the market in this cage. It was alive. And it, was, it struck me as being really weird and out of place. Now, there's 9,000 plus species of birds in the world. You can't know everything. But it just didn't seem right. And when I went back and looked up in the literature, it's from a type of bird that's only known from Thailand. And based on the, the, the notes I took on the description, it turns out that it's a new species of bird. And only about one new species of bird is discovered about every two or three years. And so I'm very itching to go back to uh, describe that. But we have a little R&R. &R. This is uh, the men's club uh, for some local Hmong villagers. And we're invited to taste their version of, of rice wine, where they basically just had fermented rice and they're pouring water on. They're sort of drinking this cheap alcohol concoction, which um, was kind of tasty. It really sort of wet the whistle. But then we heard that the action was really over at uh, the women's <laughs> side of the river. So we took this um, suspension bridge that was missing half the middle. Um, and we were kind of a little liquored up at that point. Uh, I know that Joe and Dong decided to wade across the river, but I managed that there was still a steel cable that you could balance on here and hold on to this one and made it across. Because yeah. these little kids, little kids were sort of like mocking me that, that I wasn't brave enough, so I ended up doing it. <laughs> A village of, of Hmong weavers. And these women are fantastic. They uh, showered us with all sorts of fruit and coconuts and free drinks and stuff like that. And then came the sales pitch. And we ended up actually buying some uh, incredible fabrics. And later we went to another village of Hmong. The three sisters are, they are renowned in northern 
Laos for their Lao Lao. The Lao Lao isn't a rice wine, it's like a rice whiskey. And they make the best of it. And so we are invited by them, and there's dad and there's mom watching with a close eye. Very, very nice people, very generous. <laughs> so they invite us in, and we have our local guy there, and he's sort of explaining what this is, and we have a toast. They bring out their best stuff. And so we're talking with them, you know, asking questions about their village and about the, you know, the ecosystem. And they're asking us about, mm, I don't know what the hell they're asking us because we drank so much Lao Lao that uh, you eventually end up. <laughs> when they run out of the good stuff, they bring out the stuff that's not so good, and eventually you're drinking out of an antifreeze jug. <laughs> Something, I found out something about water buffaloes, that they don't have very good vision at night. And when they're sleeping, you don't want to wake them, no matter how drunk you are. Because this thing got enraged and just started flailing, flailing its head around, and they have this like six foot span of horns, and they're stupid enough to get out of the way. All right, Laos is very interesting because there is the potential for a lot of new and interesting scientific research, and more importantly, because Laos is just developing uh, it's wildlife programs that there's a lot of input and cooperative research that we could do with the government to try to um, help the country establish reserves and try to understand their own wildlife. The idea in the past for scientific research is basically just to sort of bully your way into a country, take what you wanted, and leave. The idea now that we're trying to um, work with is a cooperative venture where we want to train people, we want them to learn, we want to share scientific information. And so that's been working very well. And I want to tell you about the last place I recently got back from. It's the tiny island nation of Sao Tome, and that's just where we're doing that type of new scientific research, where we want to work with the locals, we want to work with the government, we want to set up training programs and educational programs so that people can save their own habitat, can, can protect their own wildlife, and can then later on teach their own people about the value of, of science and wildlife. Now, Sao Tome and Principe, sounds almost like a song, so. are these two little dots right here. And it's sort of cradled in this hellhole of West Africa. West Africa now is dominated by corruption, by tribal fractionism. I heard about what happened in Rwanda between the, the, the Hutu and the Tutsis. That type of tribal fractionism is going on all throughout West Africa. There is just a horrible environmental degradation and destruction all throughout most of West Africa. AIDS is, is now up to 30 to 35 percent of the population. Uh, malaria and yellow fever are making an incredible comeback. Um, other parasites, the schistosomiasis and elephantiasis, are starting to make a comeback. It is absolutely decaying. Most of, of Central and West Africa is in a state now of collapse. Um, Westerners call what's happening right now the African Civil War because there are 17 African nations that are actively involved in either civil wars or cross-border wars with one another. And literally hundreds of thousands of people are dying every year because of this, in addition to all the disease and environmental degradation that's going on. But one bright little spot is this island nation of Sao Tome and Principe. It looks lovely right here, but what you can't really see is the fact that it's about 97 degrees with almost 100% humidity. Wow. Looks lovely though. And so two little islands, you can see here, that have a, a diversity of, of habitats and of topography and terrain. This is the central pico on uh, Sao Tome. This is a, um, a palm uh, oil, oil palm plantation on one side and a banana plantation on the other. And this is sort of a picture of daily life here in the uh, capital of Sao Tome, on the island of Sao Tome. This is one of the things where you go reach, your, reach for your camera and you accidentally push the button and it goes off. So this is something that was taken accidentally. But this shows you a very good idea of the, the populace that lives there. One of the reasons why Sao Tome isn't in such horrible shape is because, and again this is the legacy of something that's not necessarily nice, is that this was a sort of a slave um, intermediary facility. The Portuguese used to own these two islands, and they were involved in the slave trade in West Africa. Ships would come out to Sao Tome, they would reload the ships, sort of restack the slaves, and then go on. So that a lot of the people that live on Sao Tome come from a variety of different countries all throughout Africa, and did not bring this sort of tribal identity with them. So there was no um, tribal fractionism or cultural strife between competing groups. And also, it's doing very well in terms of hunger. Nobody is hungry in this country. The reason why is because literally, food grows everywhere. 
Banana trees, coconut, papaya, mango, avocado, breadfruit, peas, potatoes, literally in people's gardens on the sides of the street. So the country is very well fed for the most part. So there, you don't have this tribalism, you don't have problems with hunger and malnourishment, and more importantly, there isn't um, a corrupt political ruling class. So the country, it might be poor, but it's actually doing very, very well for the most part. Um, this is part of the Portuguese, uh, oh, I wanted to point out this too. This, these are fish. Um, there are extremely rich fishing areas around Sao Tome and Principe, and most of the protein is derived from fish, so that there isn't a big need to grow cattle and chicken and pigs and goats on the island in large numbers and destroy the habitat in order to feed them. Over 90% of the protein comes from fish. There you go. So these are flying fish that are actually split out, salted and dried and then you're used to make a soup and a variety of other uh, delicious local dishes. I'm having problems with the uh, focus knob here. Uh, this is downtown Sao Tome. You can see some of the um, uh, beautiful colonial buildings that are left over from the Portuguese Empire. And this is an abandoned plantation on 200 acres of land with beachfront access for a mere $90,000. It's an old coca plantation, and coca, um, after, not coca, cacao, sorry. Coca is what you grow in Bolivia. This is cacao, which is what chocolate's made from. Um, Sao Tome, after um, slavery was sort of uh, given up by the Portuguese, they gave up slavery a little bit earlier than, say, the U.S. did, uh, switched to other things. At one time, they were the number one sugar exporter in the world, and then later, cacao, which was made into chocolate. And so these trees are growing everywhere. This is a beautiful, uh, ripening cacao. And it wasn't until 1975 when the country got independence from Portugal. And when the Portuguese left, they didn't maintain very strong economic ties with the country. They had uh, trade agreements, but the country started to fall into ruin. And so in many areas of, of Sao Tome, it looks sort of like a post-apocalyptic New Orleans, these beautiful colonial buildings <laughs> that started to fall into disrepair. Uh, this is our home base here. This is an organization called Step Up, Sao Tome et Principe, um, Unio, uh, Union for Promotion, something like that. It's a, a um, non-governmental organization designed to promote the cultural, scientific, and economic well-being of the island. So we teamed up with these people uh, to investigate the plants and the animals and the insects of the island for a couple reasons. First is that this country is now at the stage where it needs to establish uh, protected areas and needs to um, understand its, the, its own biodiversity in wildlife. And in order to do that, you need to study it and understand just what the heck you have, where these animals live, what sorts of habitats they need, and how you could best manage these and preserve those habitats. So I went with a group of uh, people. There's plant people, bug people, uh, snake people, fish people variety of people, I, again, was very interested in the bats on the island. This right here is a disco. So <laughs> you didn't get to sleep yeah. Saturday and Sunday night, unfortunately, for a while. And um, outside of the main city, there's some small villages. This is the village of Texas. And this is, you can see right here, I was talking about fruit growing. This is a giant breadfruit tree right here with these little round breadfruits. And this is, these are bananas growing right here. And it's uh, this papaya back there. Literally, food is everywhere. And the people, are, the people are incredibly nice. And one of the things, again, like I talked about with, with Burma, when you're out looking around for stuff, the villagers are wondering, what are these fat white guys doing? Looking for snakes or, you know, picking spiders off the trees. Fortunately, we had some Sao Tomean researchers with us that spoke English and Portuguese, and we also brought some Portuguese speakers with us. And they would explain what we're doing. So originally, when there was this apprehension, they thought it was pretty neat that we came all this way to look at their plants and look at their bugs, and oftentimes we got these people involved with us to sort of, they would oftentimes show us where you could find things, like, oh, you want a cobra? Well, there's cobras over here, or if you're interested in this kind of frog, I know where they breed. So they would work with us, and oftentimes we would then have um, sort of impromptu lectures or teaching. We got on the uh, Sao Tome News three different times. Uh, we had presentations at the local wildlife club and at the local, um, uh, Middle school, there is no college on the island. So there is no sort of formal post-secondary education. So it's a real sort of one-on-one. -on -one. And because the island is so small and everybody's related to one another, news travels incredibly fast to the point where one of our guys was pulled over for not having the right tags on his car, and he recognized us from being on the news. 
But uh, yeah, same shit, different day. So here we are in some beautiful habitat, surveying the streams. Now, <clears throat> we were interested in this island for a couple reasons. First was that we wanted to know what was there, help the government out with their conservation programs, help educate the public. But more importantly, this was a weird island because of what is found there. And I mean weird in the sense that when you have what's called an oceanic island, that is an island that's formed by a volcano, when that volcano eventually makes its way out of the sea and it's exposed into the air, animals can only get there in certain ways. And there were animals that were found there that just couldn't get there any other way. Oh, these are bats, by the way. Again, bats are very important in controlling mosquitoes, which uh, broadcast yellow fever and malaria, which are two of the major diseases there. So we actually found a number of culverts where some of these important insect-eating bats were found. Um, we're also studying the civets. This is a species of uh, animal that's actually brought to the island uh, as part of the perfume trade. You guys have bought musk at the stores. Musk originally came from the scent glands of these animals, and they were raised by East African traders. And every once in a while, they'd scrape out the contents of that musk gland. And these were established on the island, or may have actually escaped from some of the uh, musk farms. It's usually not a good thing. It's not a good thing. But, for example, there are several species of frogs that are found on the island. Frogs are not tolerant to salt water at all. So you can't have frogs rafting out to the island. See, one way for animals to get to a newly...